Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here to do my Friday Reads video where I talk about the week in reading and any bookish things that have gone on in the world. Hopefully this will be a quick Friday Reads because not much has gotten gone on in the bookish world. It's been fairly quiet. We're between the announcement of the International Booker and the Women's Prize, which will be coming later this month. We have gotten off to Pride Month reading. I have really enjoyed watching Pride Month TBRs or Pile of Possibilities videos on a lot of different channels. It has made my heart very happy to see those, and I really love comparing and seeing what other people are going to be reading and how that compares to the Pile of Possibilities that I did. I'll put a link to that video in the description box down below if you would like to check it out. It's interesting because I think a lot of us have at least three or four books in common, and that has been kind of fun to see. And I've also discovered a couple of other books from some of the other TBRs that I have seen, or Pile of Possibilities videos. I prefer to say Pile of Possibilities, but TBR is the much more commonly understood term, so I also have a tendency to go with that sometimes, but I just, in my heart, I prefer Pile of Possibilities. Like I say, it was, it was kind of a quiet week. I am feeling a little better, a little less stressed since last weekend. You can see my buddy Guinness is asleep in the chair over there. I kind of mentioned in my Pile of Possibilities video that I was giving... My Pile of Possibilities for Pride Month was huge. It's a really... <laughs> a lot of titles. And the reason I did that was because I was feeling really stressed and anxious last weekend and wasn't sure where my headspace is going to be this month. I'm still not sure where my headspace is going to be this month. And I had mentioned in that that part of that is that Guinness is not doing well. Um, he was not doing well at all last weekend. He's improved this week. So I'm feeling a little bit better. And we'll just have to see. I, I don't really want to get into it because it will upset me. <laughs> But um, we are just doing everything we can to keep him happy and healthy as long as we can. And that is all I want to say about that right now. Because again, it could potentially upset me and I don't want to do that on a Friday reads. These are our escapes from the news cycle. Uh, at least for me, hopefully for you. So don't want to spend a lot of time on anything heavy. Let's just talk about some fun stuff. And not a lot, whole, lot of fun stuff has happened this past week, or at least no big interesting announcements. So uh, maybe the best thing to do is start talking about my Friday reads. But actually, before we do that, I will mention that in Missoula, where I live, Pride is going to be this weekend, and we are planning to at least make an appearance. The difficulty is that this is also graduation weekend here. Why do so many things get scheduled at the same time? We know three different people who are graduating from high school this weekend, and then Pride is on top of that. So that's really annoying. But, you know, ultimately it doesn't matter. We are still trying to stay safe pandemic-wise because... Just a lot of people have been testing positive lately, and we want to be very, very careful about all of that. So even we're still uh, wearing masks, we never really stopped. And we're like the only people left in our town who are, just about. But it makes me feel safer. So it is what it is. Uh, and then Pride is going to be in Helena in July, actually. Pride, Helena does its Pride celebration after June because... Uh, last year it was because they didn't want to conflict with Juneteenth, and this year it's in July as well. So Montana is actually having two Pride celebrations, and right now we're hoping to attend both, or at least make an appearance at the one in Missoula, but again, everything depends on what happens, so... We'll just wait and see. Let's get into the actual Friday Reads portion of this video. And I finished two books this week and I am halfway through another and just started another. So let's start talking about them. I already mentioned Life Went On Anyway, Stories by Oleg Sensov, translated by William Blacker. This was one of the books that I got in the curated book box from Good Neighbor Bookstore. I'll put a link to that unboxing down below. It is uh, by a Ukrainian author. He actually spent time in prison um, for protesting Russia's encroachment on Crimea. And when this was published in 2019, this translation, I should say, it was published in 2019, it was 
being released just as he was unexpectedly let out of prison as part of a uh, prisoner exchange, and he was released for that. So this was a book that that bookstore, Good Neighbor, was promoting as part of Ukra celebrating Ukrainian stories and getting them out in the world. It's a very slim volume. I talked about it in my May reading wrap-up, which I will also link down below, because I finished it in the month of May, just last weekend. I knew I would be able to fit it in before the end of May when I turned my focus to Pride reading for June. So I could have actually read it in a single day. It's like barely 100 pages. I want to say it's 103 pages, in fact, 104. Close. And I could have finished it in one day, but I started it Saturday morning. And by the time we were going to bed on Saturday and I kind of picked it up, I was really tired and I knew I could have finished it. There were only two stories left, which equates to like 20 pages. But I didn't think that would be fair to the book, especially since I only would have been doing it to say that I read it in one day. So I put it down and on Sunday morning, sat with a puppy and a cup of coffee and finished those last two stories. So I managed to get it in, in the month of May. Talked about it a fair amount in my reading wrap up for May, but all I will say here is it was, it was a good collection. I do think there were some awkward sentences that are probably the result of translation more than Oleg Sentsov's actual writing. It's, and, and what I will say here, in case you didn't watch the May reading wrap-up, is that there's a real palpable nostalgia for childhood in this book. And it's really about the process of growing up. It is semi-autobiographical and... It, it is in very interesting ways, I think, and I had expected it to be a little bit more political, but it's much more personal and, like I said, about childhood and growing up and how your relationships with other people change over time and sometimes fade away over time and how your priorities change, sometimes for the better and sometimes you end up falling out of touch with people and dogs and things that really meant a lot to you at another time. And I thought that was really interesting, and I would definitely recommend this. Like I said, it's very tiny, so I could have read this in a single day, but I didn't. And I would absolutely recommend it. And I'm really glad that Good Neighbor Bookstore put this in my hands and that I was able to get it finished in May before I turned my attention to Pride Reading. A book that I had started on audio in the month of May and didn't finish until this week is Ma and Me by Patsada Rang. And I wasn't really concerned about finishing this in the month of May because it is an LGBTQ story. So there's no problem with it carrying over into <laughs> June because it doesn't conflict with my Pride Month reading. I had picked it up because I wanted to read it in AAPI Heritage Month, but now I get to use it for two different things. It kind of qualified for AAPI Heritage Month, and it now qualifies for my Pride Month reading. I really liked this book a lot. I added it to my top 20 of the year so far. I won't say where because we're getting to the point where I'm going to have to talk about my favorite books of the year so far. But as I was looking at the list, I realized that I think it's the only nonfiction book in my top 20 this year. And I think part of that is because I haven't read a lot of nonfiction this year. And another part of that is that I've read some really strong fiction books so far this year. So it'll be interesting to see if any other nonfiction books break into the top 20 in the second half of the year. If you are unfamiliar, this book is about... I think it grew out of a New York Times article that Putsada Rang submitted for, I forget the series that they were doing about mothers and daughters. So she wrote an article and submitted it and they accepted it. And then that story kind of expanded into this book. So it's a story of her relationship with her mother. Putsada Rang was born in Cambodia, but when she was a baby, she was carried with her parents and her family uh, as refugees to the United States. And the inciting incident of that, which sort of sets the tone for her relationship with her mother for her entire life, is that she was very ill as an infant during this journey where they were trying to leave Cambodia. They were on a boat and the person driving the boat told her mother, 
you're wasting your time. That baby's already gone. Just throw it overboard and you'll spare us the weight. And the mother refused to do that. She held on to her baby. And when they got to their destination, she managed to find medical help. And lo and behold, Putsada Rang was fine and con continued to grow up. And obviously because she released this book, she's doing fine. So she has always felt guilty and always felt sort of obligated to her mother because of that story. So there's a sense of familial obligation that goes beyond what you would ordinarily see because her mother told her that story frequently and she felt indebted to her mother. And because they are refugees in this country, she was the, also the youngest daughter. She felt like she had to be the perfect Cambodian daughter. And she worked very hard to live up to that ideal throughout her childhood into her adolescence and even her early 20s. And she ultimately comes to a conclusion that I don't think is a spoiler, that she couldn't be the perfect Cambodian daughter inherently because she is a Cambodian American daughter. And the reason I say that, and I don't think it is a spoiler, is that this book really struggles with and grapples with that sort of refugee identity and the clashes of culture and the ways in which that impacted the generational divide between her parents and the traumas that they experienced and the traumas that they continued to have and the survivor's guilt that they have because they, of course, found out later about the killing fields and all of those things. There's a, a moment in the book where her parents take her and her sisters to see the killing fields in theaters and then they just don't talk about it. And the, she ultimately realizes the reason they don't talk about it is that her parents were so deeply traumatized that that was something that happened in their country and it was something that they escaped, but people they knew and loved did go through and perhaps not survive. And it's about the divide between being able to understand and empathize with that in really interesting ways and the obligations that her mother continues to feel to their relatives in Cambodia decades after they moved to the United States. It's a really fascinating book. And then the ultimate complication is that Putsada Rang is a lesbian and she comes out to her mother at one point and seems like everything's fine. But then a couple of months later, her mother is trying to set her up with a man and she tries to tell her mother, but I'm a lesbian. Don't you remember? And the mother's like, no, 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 no. You need to marry a man. You need to have children. You're going to shame the family if you don't. And that becomes a wedge between them. And maybe I am particularly attuned to that aspect of this story because I live in Montana. My family lives back east. And there are ways, I won't go into here, where I have sort of become estranged from them over time and ways in which I feel like I am never really going to get the satisfaction from them that I would need. So maybe I'm better off just living my life and having sort of shallow superficial relationships with them. And I'm not happy about that. I'm not proud about that, but it means that I am very attuned to everything that is going on in this book. And I think it's really beautifully done. It really reckons with different perspectives of the story. She spends a lot of time thinking about her mother's point of view and how part of the impasse that they ultimately reach is because she is stubborn and how, to, how much of that is because her mother is stubborn and how much that really just means they're alike. And it's beautiful. I really enjoyed this book. I would absolutely recommend it to you. It is on Scribd on audio and that is the way I listened to it. So I would say absolutely check this book out. I thought it was beautiful and intelligent and very well done. I would just absolutely recommend it. So those are the two books that I finished this past week. I picked up Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown once I finished Life Went On Anyway. And I made great progress on Monday, which was Memorial Day. I read almost 100 pages on Memorial Day, and I've barely made progress since then. Yeah, I'm on page 111 now, and I think I was on page 90 at the end of Monday. So you can see how the week has gone or gotten away from me before I was able to get back to it. This is something that, because it was heading into the end of May, I knew that I could just kick off my Pride Month reading with this book officially, even though Ma and me 
kind of became a carryover book, this would be the first book that I would specifically pick up for June. And this is something I have wanted to read for a very long time. It's a classic lesbian book. It was published, I want to say, in 1973, but I could be wrong about that. Uh, yeah, 1973. And honestly, so far, I'm almost halfway through, it really holds up. This book is a delight. It is funny. It is serious. It is sort of similar to reading Fried Green Tomatoes at the Whistle Stop Cafe, if you've ever read that book which is one of my favorites. I just adore that book because it has that same sort of Southern charm to it and has that same sort of quirky characters. Uh, the protagonist of this book is described on the back. Um, Molly Bolt is a genuine descendant, a genuine female descendant of Huckleberry Finn. And Rita Mae Brown is, like Mark Twain, a serious writer who gets her messages across through laughter. Absolutely. But I think Molly Bolt, the protagonist of this book, could also be a sort of edgy figure if you're familiar with Fried Green Tomatoes. So if you haven't read Ruby Fruit Jungle and you're a fan of, say, Fried Green Tomatoes or apparently even Mark Twain, because I've only read one Mark Twain book and I was in junior high, so I do not remember it. I would say absolutely check this book out. It holds up. It's a really good blend of funny and serious, and it makes a lot of really good points about growing up and caring what other people think and the ways people compromise themselves in order to fit in. I can't wait to finish this book. I am ashamed that it took me this long to get to it. I am absolutely loving it. And part of why I haven't really gotten to it this week is that I want to be able to devote attention to this book because I think it deserves it. And I'm just blown away with how much I'm enjoying it. It's a, like the perfect launch to Pride Month reading. So that is fantastic. Last night, I did start my next audiobook because I finished Ma and Me yesterday afternoon. So before bed, I listened to the first, I think, 10 minutes of Kingdom of Sand by Andrew Holleran. This is another book from my Pride Month Pile of Possibilities. It is actually released June 7th, but I have access to the audio now. And I started it, and it's only about 10 minutes, but it's really beautifully written. And it has this sort of elegiac sense of things changing over time, which actually kind of ties into Ruby Fruit Jungle as well. And Andrew Holleran is just a great writer, and I don't know too much about the plot of Kingdom of Sand, but I am trying not to get to know too much about it, because I feel like this is a book that I'm going to really enjoy getting carried away by, and we'll see how that goes. I'm really enjoying the first 10 minutes of it. Hopefully that will <laughs> carry through once I really get into the book. So, what am I going to read once I finish Ruby Fruit Jungle? Well, my plan actually, to talk about audio first. Uh, before I picked up Kingdom of Sand, I had been planning to get to Disoriental by Nego Javadi, translated by Tina Cover, on audio, because this was the April-May runner-up for the LGBTQ and Translation read-along, and I wanted to catch up to it. But I figured I want to get Kingdom of Sand because it's releasing, so I really want to get to that. And I'm already late on this book, so I might as well make it my audio after Kingdom of Sand. So that's my plan for audio. I'm going to do Kingdom of Sand, and then I'll get to Disoriental by Nagar Javadi. And once I finish Ruby for Jungle, which I'm hoping I will do this weekend, I'm of two minds about what I'm going to do for print after that. I had been planning to pick up Gordo by Jamie Cortez. This is a story collection. It was It's on my Pride Month pile of possibilities, obviously. Because I was thinking that with everything going on, I would probably want to stay away from anything serious. But we're going to see. I'm going to, because it's probably going to be at least two days before I finish Ruby Fruit Jungle. I'm going to wait and see how things are going at that time before I make up my mind. I may very well stick with the plan and do Gordo next if I'm feeling up to it. I feel up to it right now, but I don't want to make a guarantee for the, what, what things are going to be like in two or three days. <laughs> Got to go one day at a time with situations like this. Um, I might 
pick something heavier from my pile of possibilities. The downside of doing a pile of possibilities for Pride Month is that a lot of LGBTQ fiction or nonfiction deals with death and dying and AIDS. So there are a lot of books that deal with that on my pile of possibilities. And if in however long it takes for me to finish Ruby for Jungle, I'm still feeling like I do today, I might accept the challenge of one of those really emotional books. Not to say that Gordo wouldn't be emotional, but I think it would be more accessible if I'm feeling stressed or unhappy. And we'll see how that goes. And that is probably everything for this Friday Reads video. I'd love to hear what you've had going on, what you've been watching and reading and loving, how you have kicked off Pride Month reading. If you are celebrating and if you're not, please think about doing so. As always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.